Did you know that in the English language, in the English language, the word apology used to mean defense? Like nowadays, if someone is an apologist, or if you study apologetics, or if you look that up on Right Now Media, that means to defend the gospel or to defend God's word. That's what that word used to mean in the English. However, there is this guy named William Shakespeare who in his dramas and plays turned that word in apology into a kind of I'm sorry for doing something wrong. And that's how the definition in the English changed from defense to a a sign or act of remorse. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Verse 1, chapter 22. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, which was their language, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. So right away, he's connecting with his audience. He identifies as one of them. Not only that, he was just like them. Because the reason they are zealous for God is in defense of their faith, their tradition, their religion. What Paul is teaching is heresy. According to the Jews, the Messiah did not come. Jesus isn't the Messiah. According to the Jews, he was a blasphemer. He said he was the Son of God. He said he came from heaven. Saul, I mean, Paul thought the same before. So he's connecting with his audience. He says in verse 4, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon... As I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? What we're about to get here is the second of three times we hear Paul's conversion story. And now I'm doubting myself as I mention that. We get it in Acts chapter 9. Then we get it in Acts chapter 22. Then we get it again in Acts chapter 24, I believe. So you'll have to keep coming to Bible study to see if I'm right or wrong. You have to get through all, all the way through Acts just to make sure I'm right or wrong. Maybe he gives it again in 26. Yeah, I see red letters in 26. So maybe it's 26 instead of 24. Even so, I digress. Back to 22. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. 
he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. I like how Paul has given his testimony and then saying, hey, if you don't believe me, I had companions. I had witnesses who saw this bright light and heard this voice, even though they didn't understand it. They were there and witnessed it. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Now when I was studying for tonight, I I found something interesting. Paul does two things that everyone who encounters Jesus should do. Number one, identify him. That's one thing everybody in the world is going to have to, Pastor Denny used to preach this all the time. The question we're all going to have to answer one day, what did we do with Jesus? Who is Jesus to us? What's the first thing Paul did in verse 8 when he encountered Jesus? Who are you, Lord? We have to answer that question ourselves. Who is he to us? Is he our Lord and Savior? Our Savior and Lord. Then the second question, what shall I do, Lord? Well, there we go. If he's our Savior and Lord, then we must ask the same question. What shall I do, Lord? You're my master now. I obey you. We must obey him as Lord and master. Jesus said, this is verse 10, get up. And go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. Now, I was curious when I was studying. Notice it says, Paul says, he was a devout observer. I wonder if he'd passed away in between time of Saul's conversion to this point because Paul's referring to him in the past tense. So it's a possibility. Or maybe Paul was saying he was an observer of the law because he's appealing to a crowd who's full of observers of the law. What does the King James Version say, Betty? Yeah, it's verse 12. Okay. So does not use the past tense maybe it's just a translation deal yeah Yeah, so does mine hmm ah homework for all of us we move on verse 13 Ananias stood beside me and said brother Saul receive your sight you know every time I read that it's hard to get over Saul, this man who said just a few moments ago in his testimony that he persecuted followers of the way to the death, was on his way to Damascus to arrest people like Ananias. And here Ananias in grace receives him, brother Saul. Clearly Paul did not forget that because that's how he gives his testimony. Verse 13, he stood behind me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Acts chapter 9 records, 
and something like scales fell off Saul's eyes. Verse 14. Then Adonai said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you. Notice what Paul's doing. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's still appealing to all the Jews. The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know His will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from His mouth. You will be His witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. It's kind of the first clue. He wasn't a witness. Ananias did not prophesy he would be a witness to Jews or to Gentiles, but to all people of what he had seen and heard. Who's he talking to now? He's talking to Jews, a large crowd of angry Jews. Who's he going to talk to in chapters 24 and 26? Roman Gentiles. He's going to talk to all people. And we know he's talked to both Jews and Gentiles in previous chapters. Verse 15. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And this one stood out to me. And now, what are you waiting for? Isn't that a good question for us disciples nowadays to ask ourselves? What are we waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on His name. He might have lost some in the crowd at this point. Because... Jewish, believe, Jewish people believed in baptism as a representation of washing away of your sins. Remember all the people who went out to repent to John the Baptist and be baptized? It was not an uncommon thing. However, what Ananias is telling Paul to do is to be baptized in Christ. The Christian baptism. Dun, dun, dun. See how I'm getting my singing voice back a little bit? There is some tone there. Verse 17. Bill, I can sing really low now. <laughs> that tenor voice is gone. Unless that nerve wakes up and I miraculously get it back. You never know. But I can sing really low. Yeah. Verse 17. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speak to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, These people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there, given my approval, guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. There's a few things in there that really might have upset the crowd. First of all, here is a guy who confessed that he underwent Christian baptism and then went to the Jewish temple to pray. That might have ticked some of them off. But he was Jewish by birth. He was a Pharisee raised and taught under Gamaliel, an accredited and certified teacher. But the last straw was when he took to the Gentiles. Verse 22. 
The crowd listened until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. And I have a little note here, two words with a question mark. Racist much? There's a progressive mindset that makes it sound like racism's a new thing. And we do need to continue to try to fight racism. It's a sin. And when I look back on my life, I realize there were points where I was very prejudiced and even racist. I've had to confess that sin. But as long as there's human beings born into original sin. And that's going to be until Jesus comes back. There's always going to be racism. There's always going to be hate. That's not an excuse. To try to fight against it. But the only cure is the cure that the church has. Jesus, the clean heart, kind of talked about it Sunday morning, the heart cleansing, the new life that comes from Him. Yeah. I thought she did fabulous. So if you have not seen our Upstate District website page, the DS, Pastor Livy Mech have address this well. Because on the flip side, there's a conservative mindset that says there's no racist problem. Well, clearly, they've never been below the Mason Dixon line. Even today, Okay, I shouldn't say today because this was 20 or 30 years ago, maybe longer. And this is where I have to be careful about what's put on YouTube, but maybe they need to hear it. (laughs) They would run people, they would run black people out of the county my dad grew up in. And for people to say, oh, there's no such thing as racism, that's, that's being too far left. Well, you're being too far right. Because there is such thing That's racism. That's what scares me. Now I'm I'm going off on politics. I'm sorry. But that's what scares me about the church nowadays. We are so divided. Let's get back to this. Let's get back to Jesus. Preach Jesus. Keep the main thing the main thing. Sin is sin. When we hate somebody because of the color of their skin, that's sin. When we hate someone like I mean, goodness gracious, Paul just said, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. And they say, kill him, he's not fit to live. (laughs) It wasn't right then, it's not right now. I better get back to the Bible study. (laughs) Verse 23. It is. Oh. But I wish more preachers would. Just get back to the main thing. Anyway. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, you know why they were throwing off their cloaks? It's probably... Exactly. You know how hard it is to throw a stone when you've got a tight cloak on you? Yeah, let's not get any blood on our cloaks. They didn't have Tide or Shout or Spray and Wash back then. Yeah, shouting. They were doing some kind of shouting. Rid him of the earth. He's not fit to live. So, as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. 
He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting him like this. That's right, guilty before proven innocent. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Now, just back up a moment. It was the centurion who was about to flog Paul, and then Paul said something to insert centurion. Centurion would oversee a hundred. The centurion, most likely, if I understand it correctly, went to a tribune. That was the next up. I don't know how many they oversaw, but that's the name of it. I'm pretty sure. Then the commander, most likely a tribune, went to Paul and said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am. I was born a Roman citizen. Then he broke out in that number one hit, born in the... (laughs) I don't know what he... Born in the Roman Empire? I don't know. See, did you hear the singing? Verse 29. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. He'd been in trouble. He did something to get in pretty big trouble with Paul really took him to court. Verse 30. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. It's funny. That's exactly what Paul used to do. He used to go get members of the way and bring him before the Sanhedrin to be tried. Now Paul, a member of the way, is being brought before the Sanhedrin to be tried. And that's where we'll pick up next week. But I don't want us to miss how the Holy Spirit and Paul knowing who he was, disciples know who they are. Where he come from, disciples know where they come from. What he'd been through, how all that he was able to use as part of his testimony to appeal to the audience he was speaking to. God can use you the same way as you follow him. I know Darwin and I spent some time together. He spent some time in the South. He knows what it's like down there. Who knows how the Lord will use that and his story to minister to others. Just an example. Paul was a Roman, but Jewish blood is passed down by the mother. Paul was a Roman, but Jewish blood is passed down by the mom. You're not allowed to flog a prisoner without a trial. And Paul would know that. Uh. Yeah, apparently. Hi, Alicia. Yeah, because it would probably go to trial if you weren't a Roman citizen and said you were. Yeah. 
Probably. But. Next week, we'll go to Acts chapter 23.